So the thing to remember about differential equations is that you're always, a differential equation is always, is just an equation that's involving a function, possibly, and one or more of its derivatives. So technically the function doesn't have to be in there, right? Like you could totally have dy dt equal to just like five, and that could be your differential equation. Most of the time when we talk about things, usually the function's in there somewhere, but it doesn't have to be. Um, but let's look at some examples where we're gonna be given a word problem and we have to kind of interpret what that all means to figure out how to even write the differential equation before we can start solving it. So let's go ahead and let's here. Yeah, cool. Let's go with this. So um, let me write this. Let's see. 16C workshop. Let's get the date on there too. Today is January 20th, 2023. Sarah's husband's birthday. Sarah is my boss. And my friend, her husband, Zach. Okay, so um, they're good people. So let's see. So let's do this. Let's assume that the number, we'll call it A for amount, of insects in a, insects in a small population Seems like a weird way to say that, but okay. In a small population at time t measured in weeks changes. Okay, that's a clue there. Changes means there's a derivative, right? Something is changing as time is going on. We're, thought, we're thinking derivative. Changes at a rate. That's also a good clue. Proportional to the square of the number present. If initially there are 250 of these insects, and after three weeks, there are 420, how many insects do we expect after seven weeks? So what this question doesn't explicitly say, but certainly does require is that we have to one, write the differential equation for this setup and then to solve it so that we know what the function is. Because what we need, we need to know what A is as a function of time. That's what we need eventually. And currently what we know is that A of zero is 250 and A of three is 420. So that's kind of some given information. And then we also know, or at least we can work out how to write the differential equation. So I'm paying attention to this specifically. We know that um, the population at time t changes at a rate proportional to the square of the number present. We can write a differential equation based on that sentence there. So the population A changes at a rate proportional. So D A D T, that's the rate of change of A. And if something's proportional to something else, that just means it's a multiple of it. So a couple of ways people describe things they say they might say they're proportional to, or they might say the proportional. Well, usually no, proportional is usually almost always going to be in there. Proportional to just means constant multiple of, and then it might be proportional to the square or the inverse or the square root or the cube or lots of different things. So this says it's proportional to the square of the number present. Well, a is the number of insects, so this is going to be equal to a constant multiple times the square of the number present. There is our differential equation. 
That's the proportional to part. That's the square of the number present. So I really want to stress here, right? When you read the words, some rate of change is proportional to something else. That just means that your derivative is equal to a constant multiple times whatever the something else is. Usually the something else is something depending on what your function actually is. Um, another way you could write this if you wanted to be a little bit more explicit about the fact that A is a function of T is you could write this, although we don't really want to, but you could write this as dA dT is equal to K times A of T squared, just to make it more obvious that A is a function of T, but totally not necessary and probably not what we really want to do if we're going to solve this. Okay, so we have a differential equation. And if we're expected to solve it, it's probably going to fall into one of two categories. It's either going to be separable or it's going to be first order linear. I'm going to try and see if it's separable first. This looks pretty separable. At least I can pretty easily bring the A's over to the left and the T's over to the right. So I'm going to say, great. The ADT equal to KA squared is looking separable. So I'm going to divide both sides by a squared. So one over a squared times dA. I'm going to multiply both sides by dt. It's equal to k dt. Um, and I would probably do a little rewriting. So I'm going to integrate both sides, but I'm going to rewrite the left-hand side as a to the negative second. So I'm going to write this as the integral of a to the negative second dA equal to the integral of k dt not terrible at all. We can totally do this, right? It's fairly straightforward anti-differentiation. Question, Caroline? I forgot my water. Hmm. Oh, well, I will be thirsty for the next 40 minutes. It's okay. Um, so, integrating both sides here, anti-power rule, we're going to get a to the negative first divided by negative one. We don't put the plus c on the left just because it's easier not to. And then on the right-hand side, we're going to get the antiderivative of a constant is just the constant times the variable plus some other constant. Cool. Um, it's interesting here, multiplying both sides by negative one, like doesn't really do anything, I feel like. Like, I mean, this is still a constant, that's still a constant multiplying both sides by negative one. So I feel like you could just rewrite this as, well, let's see, a to the negative first is one over a times negative one equal to kt plus c. But then if you multiply both sides by negative one, I really don't feel like you need the negative sign here. So I'm just gonna say, one over A is equal to, if you really like, just to keep track, we can call this K1 and C1. And then if you multiply both sides by negative one, we can call this K2 times T plus C2. And then to solve for A, because we want to write A as a function of T, we're going to invert both sides. So I'm going to get that A is equal to one over K2T plus C2. Or if you like, a of t is equal to one over k t t plus c t. And now is where we use our given kind of data points, or the you know the where we know that the amount of insects at time zero is equal to two fifty, and the amount of insects after three weeks is equal to four twenty. So we're just going to plug each of those in to figure out what k and c are. Usually, it's easiest to start if you have like something at zero, that's usually the easiest one to figure out because usually you can just solve one of the things first. So let's see what happens. So if I say that A of zero is equal to 250. Well, if I actually plug in zero to what A of T is, I'm gonna get one over K2 times zero plus C2. So it looks like 250 is equal to one over C2. So C2 is equal to one over 250. And then we're going to do the other thing to figure out what we're going to use the other thing to figure out what K2 is. So we now know that A of T is equal to one over K2 times T plus one over 250. Let me look at something here if we can. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. So before I actually try and figure out what K2 is, I might make another change. I really don't want to plug in three for T and then do K2 
3 times k plus 1 over 250 equal to something else. That seems kind of terrible. I don't like fractions and fractions. So I would multiply the top of this and the bottom of this by 250. So I'd multiply this by 250 over 250. So that then I would have a of t equal to 250 over 250 times a constant, still a constant. So I'm just going to call that k3 times t. And 250 times 1 over 250, 1 over 250. Oh my God, can I say words? 1 over 250 is 1. <laughs> okay. Um, so then we can figure out what this constant here is. So then A of 3 is 420. And that's going to equal 250 over K3 times 3 plus 1. And then we would solve for K3. Hmm. How would I solve for K3? Good question. Mm, do, 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 do. What would I do here? Hmm, I'm curious what they did over here. Oh, that's interesting. They did that a different way. Huh, I wouldn't do it that way. Fair enough. So let's see. So solving for K3, I'm going to get, sure, let's just multiply both sides with the denominator. So 3K3 plus 1 times 420. Oh, sorry. Thank you equals 250. So 420 times 3 is, ooh, gosh, 1260 times K3 plus 420. These numbers are kind of gross, equals 250. And then let's see, 1260 K3, try staying on the screen, James, equals 250 minus 420 is negative 170. And so then K3 is going to equal negative 170 over 1260, which I suppose we could reduce as negative 17 over 126, which is terrible. But it gives us our function that gives us that A of T equals 250 over, I would, since the K3 value is negative, I would probably rewrite the denominator instead of as negative 17 over 126 times t plus one, I'd probably write it as one minus 17 over 126 times t. And I guess if I was really trying to be consistent, I would multiply the top and bottom by 126, even though that seems incredibly awful. But I guess we could do that. Fine. Again, I don't think it's super important to do this, but I guess we can. So we get the A of T equals 250 times 126 over 126 minus 17 T. And yeah, you could multiply that out if you really, 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 really wanted to. I don't really, really want to. One thing to think about here is it might be worth checking to make sure that this really does work. So let's just think about it for a minute. If we plug in zero for T, do we get 250 insects for sure right because you plug in zero that's zero 126 cancels 126 and you're left with 250 and if you plug in three for t do we get 420 probably <laughs> i mean i think so it seems likely i don't really want to check but you could all right so we so this is really the important part we we've, we've solved so this is the solution to the differential equation this tells us how many insects there are at any time t. And then to answer the final question, which was how many insects do we expect after seven weeks, we then take this solution and plug in seven. So I'm going to write this up here since I've run out of room down here. So let me go way up here. Let me go. Oh, yeah. So number of insects after seven weeks should be just a of seven, which is going to equal 250 times 126 divided by 126 minus 17 times seven, which is seven times, let's see, seven times 17 is 70 plus 49, which is 119. And then I guess we should actually calculate that because, okay, fine. That's not too bad to calculate though. So let's see. Using my, didn't bring my, did I not bring my good calculator? I think I would just leave it in this bag here because I'm always wanting it. I didn't bring it with me. So we'll use this trash calculator and we will get, let's see here. 
126 minus 119 is 7. So then 250 times 126 is 31,500 divided by 7 is 4,500. Exactly. Cool. I mean, kind of. I don't know. It's not, not cool. So the takeaway here is that we can set up a differential equation based on words, and then we can solve it using either separable or first order linear. Most of the time when you were given a word problem, it's probably going to end up being separable, but it can also end up being first order linear. Um, it sounds like the ones you're doing in class, they were first order linear. Interesting. Oh, no. oh, okay. All right. I, I, well, because you said first order linear before, I was like, that's seems... Sure. Well, no. But I'm confused. Sure. That's fair. All right. Let's go to kind of a staple, which is a tank mixture problem. We'll do this one. I've got a hand up. Also, these problems, like the problem we just did, I can, I, well, yeah, I'll post my rep, but also there's a nice solution already written up. So, yeah. Um, sure. Let's say we've got a tank. Tanks. Not like a, not like a tank that runs over things, like a tank that you fill with liquid. Um, so tank problems. Really, I guess, honestly, I wouldn't call it a tank problem. I call it a mixture problem because you're mixing things. Okay. A large tank is initially filled with 200 gallons of water with 40 pounds of salt dissolved in it. Starting at time t equal to zero, which is usually what we start at, a solution or mixture, but typically called a solution, a solution with a concentration of three pounds of salt per gallon, seems like a lot of salt, is poured into the tank at a rate of eight gallons per minute. And is drained, oh, sorry, and I should say, and the well-stirred mixture is drained at the same rate of eight gallons per minute. Um, that's a fairly typical condition on these problems is that the rate of fluid or liquid going in is the same as the rate of liquid going out, but that doesn't have to be the case. You can have them be different and it makes it more complicated. Typically, if they're different, that's when you end up having to do first, first order linear. Whereas if the rates are the same, you typically end up having to do separation. Um, so then, this actually gives us the answer. We're going to find the answer. So first things first, find a function. Let's call it A of T for amount for the amount of salt in the tank at time T. Okay, so we need to set up a differential equation for the, um, so, and I'll say this very generally, when every time a tank problem, you always want to focus on the amount, not the like, not like the proportion or the percent, but literally the amount of stuff that you care about. In this case, you were talking about the amount of salt. We want to know how much salt is in the tank at time T. And just as a note, we know that a of zero is equal to 40. There are 40 pounds of salt at time zero. Great. 
So we need a differential equation. And our differential equation should be something like the following. The rate of change of the amount of salt should be equal to the amount going in minus the amount going out. Or written more mathematically. The rate of change of A of T, that's your DA DT. Okay, how much salt is going in? Well, I'm putting in three, well, I'm putting in a solution that contains three pounds of salt per gallon, but I'm putting in eight gallons per minute. So I think I'm putting in, how do I, I like write this as? Concentration times the rate, I guess. Rate's, rate's a bad word to use it because like we're using it kind of two different ways. So, but that's what we've got. We've got the eight gallons per minute times your three pounds of salt per gallon. The rate in is usually pretty straightforward. It's usually just gonna be some constant number because you're just adding a certain amount of whatever your thing is every so often. The rate out or the amount out is always the more challenging part. But the idea is the same. The idea is that you're gonna be taking out, well, we're taking, we're taking fluid out at eight gallons per minute. Now, the concentration of the mixture in the tank is what's gonna be changing over time. Right? At the beginning, we have 40 pounds of salt per a 200, in a 200 gallon tank of water. So you can say the concentration is, you know, 40 over 200 or whatever, or you could reduce that if you want to. But the point is that that amount of salt in the tank is going to be changing. Luckily, we already have a name for the amount of salt in the tank. We have called it A of T, right? I mean, I guess I didn't write that down, but I should have. Oh, no, I did right here, right here, right here. Find a function A of T for the amount of salt in the tank at time T. So what we're going to do is we're going to say that the concentration of salt in the tank is the amount of salt in pounds, if you like, not really necessary, divided by how many gallons are in the tank, which is always going to be 200 gallons because we're putting in eight gallons every minute, but we're taking out eight gallons every minute. So the volume in the tank isn't changing. Are there any questions about this particular thing? Because I will tell you, this is the thing that always used to confuse the heck out of me when I was doing this. I was like, how, why are we putting A there? But it took me a while to get really used to it. But now I'm like, oh yeah, it makes sense. We have that this is the, so this is the uh, concentration going out. This is the concentration going in. Concentration. And this is the rate out in and the rate out. That's usually how I think of it. That's usually how most people think of it. All right. So we're going to simplify this. We're not, and we're going to not going to write. So you can see that if we, the units should make sense, which is why I like to write them, but then I'm not going to write them anymore. So if we cancel the gallons, we're going to get 24 pounds per minute going in. And if we cancel the gallons, we're going to get eight times A over 200 going out. So here's our differential equation. DA DT equals eight times three is 24 minus eight times A over 200. Which I'm gonna definitely make easier, but I will point out this equation. And here's something worth knowing that I probably haven't said yet. If you're, derivative is equal to something that only has either your top variable or just your bottom variable, but doesn't have both automatically separable. If you don't, if you have just A's and no T's, you can bring everything to the left by division, even though it might be ugly. Or if you have just T's and no A's, you can bring this DT to the right and super easy. But if you have A's and T's, that's where you have to actually worry about like, oh, is it maybe not actually separable? Okay. This one is totally separable. Um, I should point out, though, 
You could also do this one first order linear if you really wanted to. I don't really want to though. And it's not usually how it's done, I think. I don't know. I mean, either way, it's totally fine. I'm like, now I'm like, could I do it? I mean, either way, yeah, sure. So let's make this a little easier to handle. I don't want to really divide by what this looks like just because dividing by that's going to look kind of gross. Um, my personal preference is to kind of do the following. I'm going to get da dt equal to, I'm going to reduce this fraction first of all. So eight over 200 reduces to four over 100, which reduces to two over 50, which reduces to one over 25. So this is going to be 24 minus a over 25. And then honestly, I like to pull out the denominator. Or in other words, I'm going to write this as, I'm going to multiply this by 25 over 25, even though it's not particularly nice. And then write this as 1 over 25 times, um, 24 times 25 is 600 minus A. So here's my nicer, still not separated differential equation, DADT equals 1 over 25 times 600 minus A. And now I'm going to separate it. I'm going to leave the 1 over 25 on the right because it's going to be easier to do so. And I'm going to write this as 1 over 600 minus A equals, uh, sorry, DA, don't forget the DA, equals 1 over 25 DT. Now we're going to integrate both sides. Antiderivative of one over 600 minus A T A equals the antiderivative of one over 25 TT. Okay, we've seen this kind of thing before. The antiderivative of one over 600 minus A is the natural log of the absolute value of 600 minus A. What am I missing? Yeah, exactly. Oh, I'm dying. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry. And the antiderivative of this constant is just the constant times the variable plus some um, c. And now we're going to solve for a, because that's what we were asked to do. So multiply both sides by negative. Great, doesn't really, I mean, I guess it changes the negative here. So we're going to get the natural log of the absolute value of 600 minus a equals negative 1 25th plus sorry, times T as a constant. I know I've said you can disregard the absolute value. I can't make myself do it, obviously, but you could totally not write the absolute value. Be totally fine. I'm going to write it anyway. because I'm. Easy. Um, so then we E both sides. So we end up getting 600 minus A in absolute value is equal to, I'm going to do this part a little bit faster. Right? I'm not going to write e to the negative 125t plus c and then e to the negative 125th times e to the c. Actually, I'm going to write that. I'm going to write e to the negative 125t times e to the c. Yeah, question. I multiply both sides by the negative. So I know I kind of I kind of went by it quickly, but when I multiply both sides by negative 1 here, I got a negative 125t and a new constant. And then I'm going to rewrite this as 600 minus A equal to plus or minus E to the C, C2 if you like, times E to the negative 125T. And then finally, we will call that our new overall constant. We'll just call this C. And then we have 600 minus A equals C e to the negative 125T. And then isolating A, we end up with negative A equal to, I don't really like doing it that way. It's dumb. Let me look at my answer real quick here. Sure, that's fine. Okay. No, I guess that's fine. Sure. I guess it's not my final, final constant. Whatever. Equals, oh my gosh, James. C e to the negative 125t minus 600, and then multiply both sides by negative 1 to get a equal to new constant e to the negative 125t plus 600. So a as a function of t is c e to the negative 
25t plus 600. And we can totally find out what C is because we know that A at time zero, the amount of salt at time zero is equal to 40. So setting this equal to 40 when T is equal to zero, we end up getting 40 equal to C times E to the zero plus 600. So it looks like C is gonna equal 40 minus 600, which is negative something. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I should be able to do that. Um, C is equal to negative 560. So I should point out, because we've said it many times, this here is our general solution, right? Where we have a constant we haven't solved for. And then when we plug in our initial condition, right? We know that there was 40 pounds of salt in the tank at the beginning we end up getting that our particular solution is A of T equal to negative 560 E to the negative 125th T plus 600. And that is our particular solution. Cool. Now we can ask some additional questions. So, I'm just going to hand it over, I'm sure. So here's the tank mixture problem handout in case you want it. Um, I have more copies of it somewhere. Yeah, here we go. So this problem, I will point out, this problem doesn't actually go through the solving of the solution. They just give you the solution, which is probably fine. Um, yeah, so we're going to ask some of these extra questions here. So we've already answered question A. What was the initial concentration of salt in the tank? It was 40. And we use that to then figure out the general solution here. Um, but let's look at these questions. I haven't actually really looked at them. So here's the next question. Considering our answer to part A, or considering what we've got here, when the solution with a concentration of three pounds per gallon was added to the tank, Will the concentration of salt in the tank go up or down over time? So let me ask you both. Initially, there are 40 pounds of salt in a 200 gallon tank. What's the concentration of salt per gallon? Well, we can do that math. That's just going to be 40 pounds of salt divided by 200 gallons, which we should reduce to get one fifth of a pound per gallon. So now, if we start adding a solution that is three pounds per gallon, sorry, yeah, three pounds of salt per gallon, do we expect the concentration to increase or decrease? Right, we're adding something that's more concentrated, that's gonna up the concentration. And that's almost, well, in fact, we'll see something at the end here, which is kind of cool and happens all the time. Um, so yeah, so if we start adding a solution that's three pounds, of, three pounds per gallon of salt, we definitely expect the concentration to increase. And that's, I guess, the answer to part B of this handout. Um, we already did part C, where we use the initial condition to solve for the constant C. So our solution was A of T equal to, I forgot what it was already, was it negative 560? Yeah, negative 560 E to the negative T over 25 plus 600. Okay, cool. Let's look at, so a lot of times when people ask you these differential equations, the, they won't actually say to solve the differential equation. They'll just be like, here's a differential equation or here's a setup, here's a word problem. And then they'll say like, okay, Given all this information, 
answer the following. How many pounds of salt are there after 25 minutes? The implication being that you have to first solve the differential equation so you know what A is as a function of time. So there's a lot of background to this kind of question here. Uh, but now, once we have the solution, it's very easy to figure out the answer. We just plug in 25. So A of 25 is going to be negative 560 times E to the negative 25 over 25 is E to the negative 1 plus 600. Um, I don't know what 560 times E to the negative 1 is. Let's find out. I'm going to use the sideways calculator here. 560 divided by E because that's what times e to the negative one is, is going to be 206 approximately. So this is going to be approximately negative 206 plus 600, which is, a pro which is equal to what? Uh, 394 pounds of salt. Wow, that's a lot, right? I mean, I guess if you add three pounds of salt per minute, even though you're, even if you're draining solution out, you're putting a lot more in than you're taking out. Because you're only taking out right the eight pound eight gallons per minute, but at a concentration of the entire mixture per two hundred gallons. So you're not taking out nearly as much salt as you're putting in because the concentration is not so much. Um, and then same sort of question: How many pounds of salt are there going to be after after fifty minutes? Well, same idea. And obviously, the person writing this problem has picked nice numbers to plug in. But if you plug in fifty minutes. A of 50 is going to be negative 560 times, well, 50 over 25 is 2, so it's e to the negative 2 plus 600. Let's see what we get there. Um, I guess I can just divide by e again. Smart. That's going to be approximately negative 75.8 plus 600, which is going to be about... 524.2 pounds. So you so there's usually after you've solved a system like this, or right out like if you're dealing with exponential growth or decay, typically after you know what the solution to the differential equation is, there's only kind of two, um, maybe three. There's usually two kinds of questions you can ask. This is what, and I think we did this in 16b as well. Where 16b, we did like exponential growth and decay, right? You can really ask kind of like, how much stuff do I have at a certain time, or how long does it take to get a certain amount of stuff? So, when will there be 575 pounds of salt in the tank? Well, that's going to just mean we have to set this equal to 575 in solids. And I probably should just write on another piece of paper. So we're going to set our A of T, which is equal to negative 560, E to the negative T over 25 plus 600, equal to 575. And then we're going to solve. So I'm going to subtract 600. I'm going to get negative 560, E to the negative T over 25, equal to 575 minus 600 is negative 25. And then divide by negative 560 to get e to the negative t over 25 equal to positive 25 over positive 560, which I'm sure reduces. Sure, I'm sure it reduces. <laughs> um, sure, I'm going to do something kind of silly and say that that's right now, but I don't want to do that. So I'm going to multiply them both by two first <laughs> and say it's 50 over uh 1120 and then divide them both by 10 and say it's five over 112. it's just easier it's easier that way i think i don't know what 560 divided by five i probably could have done 560 divided by five i just wasn't thinking that hard about it anyway take the natural log of both sides negative t over 25 equals the natural log of five over 112 so then t is going to equal negative 25 times the natural log of five over 112. wait is time negative here it shouldn't be. It's not. It might look like it's negative for a second, but you have to remember that natural log of 5 over 112 is definitely a negative number itself because 5 over 112 is way less than 1, 
and the natural log gives you negative values when the input is less than one. If you prefer, you could write this as positive 25 times the natural log of 112 over five. That made you feel better. It doesn't make me feel better, but you know, you can. Um, that's kind of a gross number. Let's So I do know that it should be longer than 50 minutes because after 50 minutes, we only have to 524. So let's go ahead and let's figure out what we've got here. Oh, I hate using the natural log. So 112 divided by five, and then take the natural log of that. It's going to be 3.1 times 25 is about 77.7 .7 minutes. Oh, that's all right. This one works just fine for these. Okay, here is what I think is the most interesting question you can ask about these tank problems specifically. Is there a limit to the number of pounds of salt that you can have in the tank? What? Yeah, I would think too. So check this out. If we so actually the, the number of pounds is not the interesting part, but it's it it has to be the interesting part. So question F, is there a limit to the number? of pounds of salt. Well, they have definitely phrased it this way on purpose to see if there's a limit to the number of pounds of salt in the tank, take the limit of the function as time goes on and on and on and on. So if you take the limit as T goes to infinity of negative 560 E to the negative T over 25 plus 600, I would encourage you to write this in a different way. I really, really don't like having to think about what e to the negative infinity is. I've gotten better at it over time, but it's just not something my brain was always good at seeing. I find it, what's that? It is. I find it easier personally to write it as negative 560 over e to the positive t over 25 as t goes to infinity. Because then I can see that I've got e to the infinity, which is infinitely large, and then dividing by something infinitely large is going to make it be really, really small. Either way is totally fine. And that's just the way I've always kind of done it. So this is going to go to zero. And we're going to get a limiting value of 600 pounds of salt, which you might not think is very interesting yet. But I will tell you that while that number is not particularly interesting, it is interesting to think about what the limiting concentration of salt is. So let me ask if you remember, how many gallons of liquid are in this tank? So if I take my 600 pounds of salt and divide by the 200 gallons, what's my limiting concentration of salt? Yeah. Which is exactly the concentration of what we were putting into the tank. And this is true all the time if you're if it's a situation where you're putting the same amount of fluid in as you're taking out. That whatever you're putting into your tank, eventually your tank will get closer and closer and closer to having that concentration, which I think is neat. So if you take something that's like really high concentration, you got something that's much lower, eventually if you do this kind of thing where you put in and take out at the same rate, it will get closer and closer and closer to the concentration you're putting in. It'll never actually get there because you would literally have to let time go on forever and ever and ever, but it will get closer and closer and closer to it until it's probably not measurable. Neat. Questions? Final bit. I was poo-pooing your professor only going through two questions, but it looks like I might be in the same, in the same boat here. Um, let's see. Can I do anything else meaningful? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Should we do another tank problem? We don't have time to do another tank problem. Let me just talk about Newton's law of cooling for a minute, because it is something else that's a differential equation as well. And let's look, at, let's just start off with an example. And then on Monday, maybe we'll talk more specifically about it. Um, so let's look at this example. A cup of coffee is a steaming 200 degrees Fahrenheit in a room that is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. After one minute, let's say two minutes, let's make the number a little more interesting. After two minutes, the temperature of the coffee is 180 degrees. 
when will it reach a more palatable 130 degrees? Now, the assumption that we have to make here, and this is the assumption for Newton's law of cooling, is we're going to assume that the rate of change of the temperature of the coffee or whatever the thing is that you're that's that's either cooling or warming, which we will call capital T, is proportional to the difference between the coffee's temperature and the temperature of the environment it's in. Which we will call T sub S and is equal to 70 in this particular example. This is the reason why if you want to cool something down faster, you can put it in the freezer instead of the fridge because the difference in temperature between it and its surrounding is larger when it's in a colder place. Kind of neat. So here's how we set this up. We're going to say that the rate of change of the temperature of coffee, dt dt, d big t, d little t, is proportional to the difference in the temperature of the coffee and the temperature of the surrounding environment. That is the general startup for a question like this. And then in this particular example, we're going to have that dt dt is equal to k times t minus 70. That's how you start a problem. And again, I will point out right, that's the rate of change of the coffee temp. That's the proportional to, and that is the difference in temperature between the coffee and the surrounding environment. It also doesn't matter which way you do the subtraction because the constant will adjust for it, whichever way you happen to do it. It's usually nicer to do the thing that's the variable minus the thing that we know the value of, but either way will actually work just fine. It's kind of cool. Um, okay, so the way you solve this is, again, it's a separation of variables question. We're going to just rewrite this as 1 over t minus 70 is equal to k times dt. I will tell you some books go through kind of a process where they solve this generally and then you say, here is how the solution always works, which is fine. You can do that. I kind of think it's easier just to solve it because it's not terrible to solve. Um, so then we're going to integrate both sides. Yeah, we got, we got one minute. We can, we can find the general solution here. Oops, I forgot the dt over here. Apologies. So 1 over t minus 70 dt equals interval of k dt. It's terrible that we're using t and t, but one's capital and one's lowercase. So then integrate both sides. You get the natural log of capital T minus 70 equal to k times little t plus c. Look, I didn't even write the absolute value. And then we're going to exponentiate both sides. So we end up with t minus 70 equals e to the kt times e to the c, which is just going to be a new constant c. And then t ends up equaling c e to the kt plus 70. Or if you prefer, t of t is equal to c e to the kt plus 70. That's our general solution. And then we're going to use our initial condition. So here's the thing. And actually, we'll stop here because we're out of time. But what we're going to do is we're going to use both that T at time zero is equal to 200 degrees to first find C. And then T of two minutes later is equal to 180 degrees. That's going to help us find both C and 
Okay. Just like, so this is very, very similar to exponential growth and decay. There's just kind of a little extra constant you've added on here, but really it's virtually the same as solving exponential growth or decay problems. All right, that's good. Um, we'll, we'll do more of this on Monday. <laughs>